But yeah, that's what this book is about, uh, in large part, uh, this man's weaponized psychic penis. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Mmm. Mmm. Pretty good. Today's episode is brought to you by Odyssey. Odyssey is this awesome crypto-based YouTube alternative. And uh, it's like YouTube in the old days, when it was cool. And their big thing is about freedom of speech, lack of censorship, and uh, no advertising. And uh, you can donate crypto on there to creators you like, and you can put it onto Bitrix, and you can exchange it for Bitcoin or Ether or whatever you want. And uh, I think that's just awesome. I really admire what they're doing over there. If YouTube starts to, to really, you know, get weird, then they, you can find me over there. I really like the idea behind it. I think it's very forward thinking and very smart. You can check it out using the link below. Thanks a bunch. Today is the most requested review on the channel. Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pinchon. It has taken a very long time because Gravity's Rainbow takes a very, very long time to read. This version is 776 pages long. Um, it's one of the densest things you'll ever come across, of course. I mean, you've heard about it a thousand times. But for those of you who aren't already aware, as many of you have been aware or have attempted this beast yourselves, it's almost a rite of passage among online literary snobs. You have to read the trifecta, what is it, Joyce's Ulysses, Gravity's Rainbow by Pinchon, and uh, Infinite Jest by Wallace, before anybody will take you seriously on 4chan or whatever. This is a very famous influential postmodern novel, probably the post-war postmodern novel, written by the notoriously reclusive uh, American author Thomas Pinchon, who is still with us and is kind of battling Cormac McCarthy in my head for the spot as the greatest living American writer. Pinchon was in the Navy, studied at uh, Cornell under Nabokov, and also worked at Boeing in Seattle. All of these things are immediately evident when reading Gravity's Rainbow. Very little else is known about him. He puts a high value on his privacy, and, and honestly, he's a genius simply for that decision alone, uh, I, I think personally. So this is a disjointed, psychedelic, experimental, strange, sometimes stream of conscious, sometimes not, um, sometimes easy, sometimes outrageously difficult, cataclysmic magnum opus of, an, of a novel. Now, of course, what everybody started off with uh, regarding this novel is its complex, obtuse difficulty, its impenetrability and the total and absolute impossibility of getting it all in the first read. Sure, that's true, but I would like to highlight something that I feel is of crucial importance. This is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever read. I mean, laugh out loud, perfect tempo humor. It is just hysterical. I mean, I don't think, you know, like jokes in books, like often I feel just like don't work, you know, but I mean like he really has whatever he was on. I don't know. He was able to kind of like decipher the rhythm of his prose perfectly and just like drops these one liners that are just like amazing. What's really missing from the conversations I see on YouTube is really just like the sophistication of the humor, which is which is not necessarily to say that it's like super. Um, it's not always super intelligent. In fact, the idea is that, you know, the, the, the sophistication comes from his juxtaposition of the high and low, you know, like, uh, like I was just talking about with Babbitts. But, uh, I mean, he's, he's making, <laughs> you know, outrageously crass and vulgar jokes while, uh, while doing it in, like, the smartest way possible, which just accentuates its uh, uh, hilarity. It's really perfect. I don't know if I can totally explain why, because I think that's the component that illustrates Pinchon's genius. His ability to navigate the spectrum of human emotion and experience, switching from one to the other in a way that's almost like dream logic. So what's the story about, right? What is, what is the basic story? In the simplest of terms, it's a story that takes place in the last months of World War II, uh, uh, combining many narratives that all revolve around the V2 rocket. I believe all of the stories revolve around or are in some way related to this particular rocket with the serial number 00000. The main-ish protagonist, as there are about 400 characters or so, is a bumbling all-American Joe named Tyrone Slothrop. All of Pynchon's characters are given bizarre, kind of grotesque names, who discovers he's been programmed in a Pavlovian manner to become sexually aroused by the German V2 rocket. Right which is what the Germans were hurling over the English Channel to uh, hit London, seemingly at random. So when Tyrone was an infant, he was sold off to this scientist at Harvard to be experimented on. Maybe. Though, I should add, finally, it's, it's all undetermined, inconclusive, like everything else in the book. 
because one of the major the major themes of the book is like everybody says paranoia thinking things are connected when they may or may not be at all now regarding those rockets and where they hit uh, in London I said seemingly at random because something interesting shows up on the on the Poisson distribution Which is this statistical probability measurement regarding events. I think I'm, I'm not a math person you see <laughs> Slothrop's sexual adventures his flings um, the women he has sex with in London seem to correlate exactly with the impact locations of the v2 rocket Everywhere he bangs someone several days later. That's where the rocket hits and one thing my wife brought up was wouldn't he get erections after the rocket hits and it's a good question I don't know about that but yeah that's what this book is about uh, in large part uh, this man's weaponized psychic penis mm -hmm. that's why everybody wants to get Slothrop or get to him uh, including this organization of, of psychics and he's sort of running around all over war-torn Europe trying to figure out if he's just paranoid a frequent theme in Pinchon's writings I'm sure you've heard or if indeed they are out to get him and they they is is not clear it is not clear who they are. Is everything actually as connected as it seems? Is everything meaningful or nothing? Or both? Meanwhile, you have a subplot involving two half-brothers kind of associated with the rocket. Obust Enzian, a man from the African Herero tribe, which was a tribe that suffered genocide at the hands of the Germans in German-occupied Africa, which is now Namibia, I think. Really, really horrible, true story. Who is the leader of the Schwarzkommando, a group of Herero rocket technicians, building the rocket the uh, the the special one with all zeros for the antagonist of the book who is an SS officer with the code name Blissero which means death and who is also at one point at least uh, Enzian's lover and then Enzian's Russian half-brother Colonel Vaslav Chicherin who is sent on a mission to destroy him and the Schwarzkommando and that's just that's just bare 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 bones and then then all kinds of stories and references of the most bizarre variety frequently it turns into a musical with songs written and sung by characters 1940s goofy Americana military macho humor it's a giant glorious mess what can I say I it, it's kind of um perfect and uh, uh, at first it might be terrible but then but then you just submit or something <laughs> but then there are just these magnificent paragraphs that allow you to experience things you've known and felt but I've never been able to articulate yourself and that's the sure sign of a brilliant novel for me there's just some of the best things I've ever read in that book this happens when he's uh, in Nice I just I just love this I thought it, it touched something that I've actually experienced before and I, I don't know you know it's it's intangible really it's something I can't really describe but I've just I felt it and it, it just kind of stopped me dead in my reading tracks so to speak and I was just like man it's powerful just for the knife edge here in the Rue Rosini there comes to sloth up the best feeling dusk in a foreign city can bring just where the sky's light balances the electric lamplight in the street just before the first star some promise of events without cause surprises a direction at right angles to every direction his life has been able to find up till now and I just thought that was brilliant it's not one of the more famous passages in the book but it's one that uh, just hit me personally this is the only book that correctly reaches coalesces and kind of assimilates the absurdity of us having created weapons that, uh, capable of absolutely destroying ourselves like we forget on a day-to-day -day basis that that's a possibility right out of necessity too just so we can function I think and not kind of collapse in a, in a, in a, a, a nervous breakdown of anxiety and so what could it be other than the love of death itself a death drive so strong that men will sacrifice their entire lives into projects constructing the ultimate vehicle of annihilation our annihilation you know there never was a Dr. Jamf opines world-renowned analyst Mickey Vukstri Vukstri Jamf was only a fiction to help him explain what he felt so terribly so immediately in his genitals for those rockets each time exploding in the sky to help him deny what he could not possibly admit that he might be in love in sexual love with his and his race's death. Dr. Jamf was the evil scientist who experimented on Slothrop. Mixed in the tapestry are commentaries on war, power structures, racism, everything. It's really an enormous, all encompassing work. I've never really read anything quite like it in my life. Um, not Infinite Jest, not The Recognitions by Gaddis. Um, none of this comes close. I mean, it's. it's, it's 
I mean, he wrote it like in his 30s too. It's just, it's insane. It's, it's amazing. He also wrote V. His V was his first novel, and I think that was in his mid 20s. And I think there are some recurring characters. I haven't read V. This was the first pension I've uh, I finished. The absurd infernal carnival of that era in World War II, as it's as it's uh, ending, kind of the last months, has never been illustrated in more of a nihilistic fall of Rome, jovial Broadway musical fashion. It sounds like a contradiction because it is, of course. It's 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 bonkers. <laughs> yes, it's certainly an anti-war novel but how it's anti-war is what's compelling to me. What it reveals about the war, which is still really like the, the big um, event in our recent history, unquestionably. Mankind's war lust, sort of. It's infatuation with empire. And of course it's detrimental effects on little me and you. This is like Dr. Strangelove combined with Fellini, metaphysical spirituality, Freud, mathematics, dick jokes, tons of them, and show tunes. Uh, it's my idea of a good time. Throughout the entire book, you'll either be tearing your hair out in frustration, laughing your ass off, or throwing up. The scene with the trained octopus named Grigori attacking Katya and Slothrop saves her because Teddy Bloat just happens to have a crab nearby to lure the octopus away. Replying to Slothrop when he inquires where he got the crab, I found it, is hysterical. It's, it's pure Monty Python. It reaches both heights and depths previously not thought possible. It's really funny. There are scenes of graphic description that rival the Marquis de Sade in their ability to uh, induce nausea. Coprophagia, uh, shit eating, castration, every kind of sexual deviance you can imagine. But I mean, if you're taking this on, you, I think you know what you're getting into and you can handle it, you know, be an adult. But yeah, the, the, the dominatrix scene with Katya, um, Jesus, page 238. It cost this book the Pulitzer in 1974, I think. Gravity's Rainbow was chosen to win the prize but then it was revoked because of that scene, which I love and which I imagine Pinchon was not unentertained by either. Because of that, nobody won the prize that year. Even the beginning with this onslaught of uh, Pirate Prentice's banana-based dishes was just absolutely hideous. Totally put me off of reading the book the first time. I was just like, nah, not in the mood. <laughs> but then here I am calling it like a work of genius, which it is. I mean, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. This book is, it really just doesn't. You know, it doesn't matter. If at first you're put off, just read the damn thing. It didn't really click for me until page 158 or so. It took it took quite a while. I really hated it before then. I really, really just couldn't stand it. Thought it was just like super verbose and just really, really just, uh, uh, just god awful to read. Uh, and then, I don't know, something happens and you just sort of slip into it. Gravity's Rainbow refers to the parabolic arc of the V2 rocket. I got that from this uh, fellow John David Ebert's video on YouTube, which was very, very helpful, very concise. A phenomenally straightforward explanation of Pinchon's history in the book. I, I've linked to it below. I highly recommend you check it out. It's intentionally disorienting and confusing in a way that I feel I've heard some people say is a kind of um, fuck you, you're not smart enough to get this sort of uh, uh, attack almost on the reader. Uh, I disagree. In my opinion, because of the humor, because of the goofy silliness, I'm going to I'm going to choose to think the best of Pinchon. Uh, I'm going to choose to think that uh, to, you know to think that he's not just writing this to to uh, to fuck with us. Uh, at least not in a way that is um, intentionally um, uh, kind of like revenge on the reader. Not totally, at least. What I'm going to assume to think is that, uh, and I think we ought to do this for all for all writers usually, unless it's blatantly obvious. But uh, I'm going to choose to assume to think that he is is saying, yeah, you're smart enough to get it. Now check this out. And then he writes something absurdly perfect. I don't think there's anything wrong with challenging the reader because there is in fact somebody out there who is smart enough to get it and appreciate it. Many people, in fact. And you know, a lot of satisfaction is, is gained when you do figure out what the fuck is going on. Maybe not on the first read, but eventually, right? And I think Pinchon knows that. Um, so he's not giving it to us all at once. If at first you don't understand it, like most of us I'd wager, try again with some supplementary material. It's worth it. And it's fun. I'm not somebody who needs to be catered to, you know, by the, by the author. I'd rather be challenged and learn something about the world around me, uh, or the world that has come before me, and also discover in the process the limits of my comprehension. That's kind of, you know, why we're reading literature, right? Right? Well, that's the reason I'm reading books. So better than food, without question. Better than big yellow banana breakfasts. So what did I dislike, if anything? In the beginning, almost everything, and in the end, nothing. 
It's a very smart mystery comedy tragedy for very smart people. I think this can come off as try hard or high. Very, very, very high. I honestly have no idea what he was on, if anything. It's going to rub some people the wrong way. I took it in increments of uh, approximately five pages a day over the last year or so. Maybe less, I'm not sure. It was about all I could stand. I will say that ironically, uh, despite the enormity of the book, I never felt like I really knew any of the characters at all. Rather, it was the author that I got to know the most. What's amazing is Pinchon's ability to pack in so much information and suggest so many different narratives all going on at the same time. The sheer amount of stories you have in this book is outrageous. On almost every page, it seems you have like a plot for a novel. Yeah, if you actually want to just see something that is in fact genius indisputably, uh, th this is it. I've decided that while one could write him off as impenetrable, that's gotta be a pun somewhere in here, or verbose or disgusting or goofy. While he may be all of these things in abundance, and he is, you know, uh, nevertheless, it would be an enormous mistake just to, just to write him off. No matter what, it is always going to be your loss. This is an unbelievably complex work, really difficult to, to just comprehend somebody in their 30s doing it. Just the nuance and depth balanced with the oddball humor and references really just suggests someone with several more decades of experience under their belt. It's not my favorite novel, but it's one of the best I've ever read. And uh, maybe I'll do another, another uh, update on what I've discovered from it uh, down the road. But um, for now, I know The Book Chemist has uh, some videos on it. He did a, I think he did like a, a regular review and then he did like a, a kind of read through thing part by part, so you might find that helpful. The Bookworm also had some good stuff to say on it and uh, I'll link those videos below. So you should read it. Anyone who wants to read one of the greatest literary accomplishments in history. If you're a fan of Joyce or Wallace or The Recognitions by William Gaddis, large, dense, time-consuming but immensely rewarding pieces of literature, I suggest you highly prioritize this one. A kind fan of the show named Casey sent me this book by uh, uh, an illustrator and a porn star named uh, Zach Smith, and this is uh, pictures showing what happens on each page of Thomas Pinchon's novel Gravity's Rainbow, uh, which is pretty rad. Thanks a bunch, Casey. Really appreciate it. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's just like um, these kind of uh, sketches, right? You know, these sort of like um, uh, ink drawings. I thought it was pretty awesome. I don't, I don't know if it's every single page, but, uh, but there are tons of illustrations. I think that would be the infamous uh, banana breakfast, which one commenter on some video, I don't know where it was, he said it was sort of like the, uh, the, the Bubba, Bubba, Bubba's monologue from Forrest Gump where he's talking about the shrimp. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but, but just really grotesque. If you're interested in picking this up, I put a link below as well. You're really only going to get a couple of these reading experiences in a lifetime. Choice is yours, but uh, I would say you, you gotta read this one. <sighs> Coffee time. For those of you who are new, I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video. I place their names in this mason jar. I pull out a name for every review and I send whoever's name I pull out a hard, a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee. Usually roasted by yours truly, but lately by one of the wonderful roasters here in Portland, Oregon. Because of the pandemic and health, and you know, it's also good to help support small business. If you would like to get in on that, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. I sincerely appreciate it. $1 or more will get you access to the patron only reviews, the Discord channel, and the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, music, films, changes week to week. If you'd like to get in on that, the link is below. Thanks so much. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. Thanks a bunch to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Lachlan. Lachlan S. Thanks a bunch, Lachlan. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pinchon, plus some delicious coffee. Cheers. Hope you love them both. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this and uh, always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon.